bow in humble servitude to him as we approach his throne and ask these our supplications this morning. Would you join me as we pray and then we'll finish together as God's people with the Lord's Prayer. Loving God, we are limited in our understanding of you, but we know one thing, that you care for each one of us and for all of creation. We thank you this day for loving us with an unfailing and an ever-forgiving love. We thank you that you are with us in both our joys and rejoicings and in times of sorrow and despair. We thank you for the life of Jesus Christ whose life shows us the way to live, how to treat others, how to have happiness in our lives. We thank you for your spirit whom we celebrated on the day of Pentecost last week, who leads us and speaks to us each and every day, who guides us along life's way. We pray now that as we gather here in this place, you would help us to uplift and rejoice with one another as we celebrate you and the Trinity on this Trinity Sunday, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We ask you, Father, to warm our hearts and unite us together that we might open up our lives to you and accept all of your love and then to respond to it by entrusting ourselves to you. With all that you have made us and given us in our lives, help us to use it to worship and to glorify you and to help others here along this journey. Father, we thank you for each and every one who's gathered here this morning. We thank you for the many others who could not be here for various reasons. Be with them as they're traveling. Be with those, Lord, who are working this day as well. And Father, for those who've lost loved ones over the past week, we think especially of Sister Toodle and Buddy and that entire family at the loss of our dear sister Susie Amos. We pray that you would comfort as only you can and wrap your arms around them and help them to feel your love and our love as it surrounds each one. We ask all of these things and so much more that escapes our finite minds this morning, but you know our thoughts, Lord. We ask it all in the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who taught us to pray as he said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Again, welcome to our service this morning. Are you glad to be in church this morning? Thank you. Very happy to see all of you on this Memorial Day. In doing research for this, I came across this. And the name of it is, I'm proud of you, my son. And it really comes to heart about parents having to let their sons go off to war and not knowing if they're coming back or not. But this is a beautiful writing. And I asked Brian if I could read it because it really fits. I'm proud of you, my son. He stands in the gathering twilight holding a small flag, stooping, straining to read the names once again on the gravestone of my many. My son, I'm proud of you, he whispers. He journeys back in his mind to a little boy chasing butterflies, to a teenager laughing and waving as he drives away with friends, to a young man solemnly imploring, Dad, I've got to go fight for my country. Goodbye, he said, shaking hands, this newly minted soldier in uniform whose honor and integrity demands. He follows those who went before to preserve the values and freedoms that made America great. I'll come home soon, he said, but he didn't. Now his father's fingertips traces his name on the cold, polished granite as he whispers, I'm proud of you, my son. Now I'm gonna read the scriptures, and it's from Psalms 29. Ascribe to the Lord, ye heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord that the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. 
The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon slip, slip, leap like a calf, sound like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strikes in the forests. Bear, and in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we continue in our mode of prayer, let us turn in our hymnals to number 265 and sing our hymn of prayer. The Spirit of God, descend upon the top 265. <laughs>
we rejoice in the giving of our tithes and offerings to our Lord and Savior. <laughs>
on this week where we remember those from our country who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. We also have to remember Christ's ultimate sacrifice for us. But we also have to remember that Christ arose to, so that he, could, and he will come back and rise again. On that day of his betrayal, Christ took the seven disciples to pass over to him. He took a simple item, the unleavened bread, and he blessed them. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he simply said, this is my body. He didn't remember something.
stand. God will shoot for just a few moments. Take a hug, shake a hand, whatever you're comfortable with, and let us rejoice in the peace of <laughs>
flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray just before the message. Amen. Father God, at this time, clear our hearts and minds of everything that would prevent us from hearing what your Holy Spirit would say to us through your message, through this word that goes forth from this place today. We pray, Lord, that it be beneficial to our spiritual lives, and Lord, that you would use us in this coming week to be your ambassador um, in the world that we travel in. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all of God's children said, Amen. So Trinity Sundays today, I'm almost always tempted to think of a good excuse for ignoring and all the suggested themes and readings and doing something else. So I figure that's probably a good indication by God that I shouldn't uh, do that. So one of the main reasons I usually follow the lectionary as closely as I can and the church calendar is it stops me from ignoring difficult topics because when the lectionary rolls around you're supposed to preach on it. Well, that's what you get. It's not, it's not a roll of the dice or anything like that. You preach on what comes up for that Sunday and you just kind of flesh it out with the Word of God. So uh, it keeps preachers, I think a lot of times, from just preaching on their favorite topics over and over and over and ignoring difficult topics. So I'm not the only preacher, trust me, that cringes at this one. When we get together for lunches or anything like that, it seems that uh, that's what we talk about. Uh, there was an English preacher, Colin Warrens, one time that said, any preacher with any sense at all calls in sick on Trinity Sunday. So I didn't do that this morning. The main problem with Trinity Sunday, of course, is that it asks you to preach about the doctrine of the Trinity and that teaching that God is three in one, traditionally expressed as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, whichever uh, you prefer. But it still is just one God. Now, apart from the fact that it's very difficult to work out the math on that one, it's a difficult topic to preach about because the contours of the argument are very, very subtle. The greatest intellects in the world have trouble with explaining the Trinity and understanding the Trinity. So there's not much chance of me explaining it completely this morning either, trust me. I think it's an important teaching, but its importance isn't in whether you believe it or not. That's not what we're talking about. The importance is of what sort of God are we trying to describe through the Trinity. The issue that was at stake when the doctrine was hammered out wasn't the math. It was an issue of how God relates to us in all of those things. And that's what is important. So that's what we're going to talk about here this morning for the next few minutes that we have together. The doctrine of Trinity isn't taught in the Bible, specifically. There are things in the Bible that suggest that perhaps God might be understood as a Trinity. But there's nothing that attempts to explain it or that says it matters whether you or I or anybody else believes it. But as I said earlier, there was an important reason why the idea was developed and why it came to be seen as important. In essence, what happens, there were some people who I'll introduce in just a moment who were saying, God is like this, and you must view God like this. And there was another group of people over here saying, no, God is like this, and also like this, and we can't lose that. So the first group were saying, no, you can't have it both ways. Our view is right, and yours is wrong. Does that sound familiar in the world today? Mm -hmm. On more than one topic, right? Not just religion. So, now I'll put some description in that little argument. If I don't put any description in it, it's not going to mean a lot to you. So let's have a go. Let me illustrate by quoting for some hymns. Seeing that most of us uh, get a lot of our images from God from what we sing in the hymns because we feel that they were inspired by God for the people to write them from the scriptures. 
Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Then there's the old favorite, crown him with many crowns. Crown him the Lord of heaven, enthroned in worlds above. Crown him the king to whom is given the wondrous name of love. A city stands on high, his glory it displays. And there the nations holy cry in joyful hymns of praise. Then, O oh, worship the king, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his power and his love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, surrounded with splendor and girded with praise. So now as we think about those few hymns that I've read the first lines from, what kind of God, answer to yourself, what kind of picture of God do you get in your mind? What do you think about when you hear those lyrics that I just read? Okay, now let's try some other hymns, some alternate hymns. Have a listen to these. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us your humble dwelling, all your faithful mercies crown. Jesus, you are all compassion, Boundless love that makes us whole. Visit us with your salvation. Enter every trembling soul. And then there's the old chorus. I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. Yet they turn away. And then, from heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veiled, not to be served, but to serve, and give your life that we might live. Now, what kind of God do we picture from those hymn lyrics? What do you hear? I think you'll find two quite different images of God have different implications for us and how we see ourselves, especially how we see ourselves in relation to God. If you hold one of them to the exclusion of the other, then it dictates much of your view of what it means to be a human being and live here on this earth. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. Let's get in, um, was it Mr. Peabody's Wayback Machine? Are you the one that had that? I'm dating myself now, aren't I? So let's go back to about the 4th century. Let's set the dial for the 4th century and pull the lever. Check out the argument that led to nailing down the doctrine of the truth. So the principal characters were a couple of blokes called Anathanius and Arius. Now on the surface, the debate was actually about whether or not Jesus was divine. That is, whether or not Jesus was God. But as I've suggested, the underlying question is, what is God like? What was being held true in those times, and you'll have heard me say this from time to time, is that when we are looking at Jesus, we're looking at God. That Jesus is the complete self-revelation of God in the universe. God in human form. That Jesus is God in human the old Nicene Creed expressed it by saying that Jesus was God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not created, of one with the Father. Now, Arius couldn't come at this. He rejected that idea that Jesus was God. He was in that camp. He argued how Jesus should be understood as an exemplary human being, yes. Now, Arius had a point. A lot of what he argued about the humanity of Jesus was good theology and has been reclaimed by theologians since then. But the problem with Arius was his one-dimensional way in which he saw God, and he wasn't willing to see him any other way. For Arius, God was so far above us humans that the idea of God taking on human expression was an outrage. God, by definition, said Arius, is self-contained, complete within himself, and not needing to communicate himself in any other way. God is exalted, pure, absolute, glorious, and for Arius, the idea of God lowering himself to become personally involved with the creatures that we are, that he made, was just demeaning and blasphemous. And he even called it a pagan vulturization of God. It made God like one of the gods of the Greek mythology that you see looking down over the earth and moving people around like palms on a chessboard. Sort of superhero who ate and drank and fought and occasionally dropped in to knock off a human being. Humanness and divinity are too far removed from one another for a connection, said Arius. We're too far down here, and he's too far up there. God is the great God on high. But then enter the team for the defense, if we're in a courtroom here, championed by Anathasius. Anathasius took issue with Arius' position at his central point. He said, being self-contained, being superior and distant, 
isn't the essential feature of being divine, he said. We as humans, perhaps even more now than ever before, tend to worship independence before we worship God. And we easily imagine that God relates to the world in the same way that we relate to the world. Remember as a teenager? Think back. I know it'll be a stretch, but try it. What was the main thing you wanted as a teenager? You wanted independence from your parents, right? You wanted to go, stay out as late as you could, go with who you wanted to, come back when you wanted to. You didn't want to be dependent on your parents anymore. Then as parents, you grow up and you become parents yourself, then what are you trying to do? Now you're trying to save for retirement so you won't be dependent on your kids. Then some people are often afraid of marriage because they fear having somebody really need them. They're uncomfortable with that. Somebody who can't keep their distance. But even the worst is the fear they feel like that I might come to depend on that person. Distance as a human being is so comfortable. Don't we all like our personal space too? You know, when you first meet somebody and you go to shake hands, you know. I used to tell people, you're either a hugger or you're not. I'm a hugger. And I've made a whole lot of people, I'm sure, over the years uncomfortable with the first time I meet them, just running up and hugging them. So some people don't like that. You have to learn who is and who isn't. And that's especially hard when you're preaching. So you kind of have to remember that way. But I shake hands with them. I hug them. I do the side hug with them. And all those types of things. We like distance as human beings. We really do. It, it makes us comfortable. I'm control, in control of what's all around me. People who work in human services, in the human services industries out there, often talk about what you call professional distance. Don't get too close to your clients. You know, if you're a doctor or if you're an attorney, you know, you deal with these people that have really sad situations, but you can't get too close to them because if you do, you'll lose objectivity. If you start caring too much, your judgment will be affected. And that's all really well, but Anastasius argued that we must... We make a serious mistake if we have to paint that style to God in our minds. We make a mistake by doing that. He argued that the essential defining feature of God wasn't independence, but was self-giving. Love. Love that gives over and over and over again and gives unconditionally. And he argued that that self-giving occurs even within the Godhead. That between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's total Mutual self-giving. And that self-giving looks outward and expresses itself to everyone. God gets totally involved with us, he thought. Loving, <coughs> cherishing, nurturing, nurturing, speaking to us daily. Our longings, our craving. He wants our response in prayer and devotions. So he is really connected with us, he thought. God is the spirit who moves through us with every breath who whispers into our ear, who prompts us and cajoles us to do the right thing each day. And Anastasius accused Arius of having a sterile God who doesn't generate any of that, who doesn't shine to his people, who doesn't communicate with his people, who doesn't reveal himself to his people. A God who sits in isolated splendor, useless, irrelevant, way on high, just looking down at us and not interacting with us. The God made known in Jesus is dynamic and involved and always busy relating and cherishing and revealing and expressing and giving. We all know this to be true today here who are Christians. We all know this. God has been actively at work in our lives in the good times and in the bad. A God who knows joy and pain. A God who longs for us to return the love that we are shown not only by Him but by others around us. Hence the most famous scripture we have that we talk about all the time, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Because that's so hard to do sometimes. A God who hurts when we're, we fail to respond to him as we should, when we damage ourselves then in the process. So needless to say, if we fast forward to today, Anastasius won that debate and the doctrine of the Trinity. It was spelled out. But it's amazing as you walk through life today, how many Arias did you still meet, right? There's no shortage of church people around who would espouse the Trinity as a doctrine, but teach an Arian image of God, high exalted, distant, uninvolved in their lives. So that's why I reckoned a couple weeks ago that it was worth tackling the Trinity question and not just picking an easy sermon out from six or seven years ago that nobody would remember. 
As much as it is difficult, that's why you should do it. Those Aryan images of God make me cringe even more because God is truly a compassionate spirit. God has created us in order that we and God might relate to one another here on earth. God needs you and will be unfulfilled until you respond to His love and begin to give in return as passionately as He gives to you and me. That's why church is so important. We need to recognize our interdependence on one another. Sure, we could sit at home, we could flip on the TV and watch a, a, a preacher preach a message. We could flip on the radio and listen to some Christian music. We could take our Bibles and lay them on our lap with just total silence around us and meditate. Absolutely, you can do that and have a relationship with God. But we need that interdependence with one another. I truly believe. If God was utterly self-contained and professionally distant from us, then we could respond in that same uninvolved, individual manner. But the God who's characterized by loving all and giving of himself to all really needs us to learn to love and give to each other and come together like this, at least weekly, and be in community with one another. So I pray today as I close out this message on the Trinity that each of us as we leave this sanctuary today will have a better understanding of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and a deeper relationship with all those facets of God. And that he'll work within us and through us each and every day. Let's pray. Father God, we give thanks for your Son who you gave in your great love for the world so that all who trust him may be born from above of water and spirit and have eternal life, sharing with him in his sufferings and his glory. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit too who lives within us from the day that we give our hearts to you and who speaks to us day in and day out, who leads us, who guides us along this path that we call life. We need that direction, God. We pray that even though we're so resistant, Lord, to sometimes living for you and doing the things that you would have us to do, that you would help us each and every day to live for you and to rejoice in exactly who you are creating us to be with our faults and all. We pray now, Father, as we close this service, if there is anyone here who needs to make any decision for you or who needs the support of their church family, that you would speak to them, Lord, and lead and guide them through that decision and help them to know that they are among friends and that we love to share and rejoice with them in any decision that they make. We pray again for those who are not with us this day, for those who are grieving over lost loved ones. We pray for those who are traveling. We ask your blessings to be upon the remainder of our day today and the week to come. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close this morning with our hymn of commitment, we're going to sing, We have a story to tell to the nations. Please remember, as we go out into the world this week, we are the hands of the of Christ. Number 484, we have a story to tell. If you have anything at all to share with us, please come forward as we sing, or you may meet with me after the service or contact me anytime during the week. This is God's time and your time. And there will never be another moment just like this one. So let's use our time wisely that God gives us. 484. <laughs>
pour a blessing. Love you all. Have a great week this week. If you're traveling far, do be careful. They said this will be one of the busiest travel seasons ever with an increase in 4%, I think they said, with travelers both on the road and uh, in the skies as well. So do be careful if you're going to drive anywhere this week. And we'll see you back here next Sunday. In the power of the risen Lord, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Go now in peace and serve the Lord with gladness. And remember the God who made this amazing universe is creating you and you every day. Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, offers you the peace that never dies. And the Holy Spirit is setting your hearts on fire right here, right now. So go in peace and be transformed that you may change the world. Thank you.